Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Interabang Chats. I'm Ishida Kent, and I am so excited for this one. I have been, like, I don't even know if I need to do an introduction because the career is amazing. He's a screenwriter, he's a playwright, he's an author, and now he's a romance writer. So, ladies and gentlemen and others, Paul Rudnick! <laughs> Oh, thank so you so much, and I'm so glad to be here. Oh, and I'm so excited to talk about your latest novel, Playing the Palace. So, you know, you've done so much over the course of your career. How does it feel to kind of delve into the romance world now? Oh, I love it. It's fun because it's also one of the things I love about being a writer is that you're always sort of starting from the blank page and you're always up for a fresh challenge that it's not the same routine every day. So when I had the chance to do an all out romantic comedy, I just leapt at it. I thought, oh yeah, especially because with what we've all been going through over the past year and the past four years, there's been so much stress and so much anxiety and so much despair that I thought, no, 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 I want an escape. I want to give the reader a treat. And so Royal Romance felt like exactly the right destination. So it's really yes. been a joy. Yes. And so playing the palace, that idea came about, when, when did this kind of idea pop into your head of? Well, it was interesting. It actually, I first came up with the title and the notion of some form of Royal Romance practically like 20 years ago, I'd been fooling with it and I could never tell where the idea wanted to land, whether it should be a play or a movie or a book. And it was only when I started the novel when it suddenly all started to click. And I thought, oh, I know what this is. I know whose voice should tell this story. And when I pictured Carter Ogden, this New York City event planner who's just been dumped, who kind of has two roommates, you know, who's kind of pretty down there on the social scale. And I thought, oh, okay who's the last person on earth he would get involved with? And then I thought Prince Edgar, the crown prince of England. And I thought only in Manhattan could two guys like that actually cross paths because that's what New York does. It throws people together and it's unexpected and it's surprising and it's weirdly possible. So then once I, I had Carter's voice and once I could picture Prince Edgar, it just sort of poured out and I just, had the best time, you know, figuring out. I think one of the things I love about, about romance is that you get to justify a happy ending, that you're not dealing with trauma, you're dealing with obstacles certainly and with the highest stakes, but you're not expected to bring people down. Um, and it's so, it, there's something just so celebratory about it. And that's what I really wanted to be part of. Absolutely. Happily Ever After is one of my favorite parts of Oh, you just froze. Let me see. I'm not sure if I've done something wrong. Um, oh, there you go. Sorry, we both froze for a second. Yeah. We but yeah, so as I was excited that it affected our computers. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, so happily ever afters. 100%. Oh, exactly. Exactly. Especially, I think, in gay stories, there have been so many completely valid and very necessary books in which that deal with prejudice, that deal with coming out, that deal with meeting resistance from family and from the world, and that sometimes have a very um, despairing tone. And I thought, okay, those, those books need to be here, but I also thought you needed a balance. I wanted to celebrate gay lives. And I know so many openly, happily gay people that I wanted to really salute them and to have as much gay romance as gay um, angst. So it was, uh, it was a great goal. Yes, absolutely. Um, and speaking of which, one of your characters, we, we talk about Prince Edgar and you talk about having him be openly gay from the get-go. Like there wasn't um, any big coming out story or like hidden romance where he has to, to show the country that he's gay. It's really cool where you've just got him gay and out there and the prince and 
that's how it is. How did you decide that that was going to be just Edgar was there already? Well, because I thought there have been terrific coming out stories, but that wasn't what I was after. I wanted also a gay character in a position of great power and influence, which the Crown Prince of England certainly enjoys. So I thought, yes. okay, we're, we're kind of used to seeing gay characters either on the margins or with a certain, um, you know, sense of, of struggle. And I thought, no, this guy is at the top of the food chain in a way, which has its own challenges, you know, and I think being in such a public position and being under such constant scrutiny and being just online fodder has its own difficulties. So I wanted to explore that kind of life. And I thought, it's interesting, you think with the royal family, there are a lot of them. So you know there are some LGBTQ people in there somewhere. So I thought, what if this guy was the first, you know, and someone who was doing was not traumatized by coming out, but somehow, but thought, okay, this is the thing I want. This is my life. I want to share my life with the people of my country and with the world, because if I'm going to function in any sort of positive manner, if I'm going to use my celebrity and my wealth and my power to do some good, then I need to be completely authentic. And that's who I wanted Edgar to be, so that he wasn't someone who was troubled by his basic self. He, however, has certainly when you're in a position of that uh, that's so central to, to the world's constant gaze, falling in love is a very specific challenge. You know, I don't know, you know, when you watch Megan and Harry, you think, my God, how did they ever get together? How did they ever meet? And I just saw them telling a story about one of their first dates was at a supermarket where they kind of pretended not to know who each other were. And you think, okay, it, I, I love them for that. I love the idea that people, even in those, you know, extremely challenged situations can find a way. And that's what I wanted for Edgar and Carter. Yeah, actually, we're going to table the thought on Meghan and Harry and come back to it because I have yeah. a lot of questions about that in terms of playing the palace. Um, but I want to talk about Carter. And first of all, as a Broadway fanatic and as a musical girl, I love that Carter, basically the love letter to Broadway that he is. Um, and then also his very Jewish family. <laughs> and how do, do these characters just kind of write themselves? Do they come to you or do you like kind of, are you writing the plot line and you were like, I need this character to come in, like yeah, well, I, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of work at the theater and I grew up, you know, just yearning for Broadway. And every year on my birthday, I would be allowed to pick a musical to go see. And back then I had the worst taste, but I didn't care, even if I was seeing a big bomb, if there was, you know, a red velvet curtain and an orchestra, I was just in heaven. And I have so many friends, actors, directors, designers, writers in the theater. So it's a community that I just adore and I wanted to take advantage of. Also because when I thought of where Carter lived and I thought, okay, he's got roommates and partitions and everybody's scrunched in together in the theater district. So, and so he's, his roommate, one of his roommates is a Broadway dancer. And I know plenty of people like that. So I wanted to use that as a backdrop, especially because I have such affection for musicals that I've always tried in all my work, be movies, novels, you name it, to attain that level of energy and joy that you get from a musical. You know, there's a high that when a show is really cooking and you can feel the audience, you know, all in and so participating and going home and playing that, you know, the original cast album constantly and wearing it out and lip syncing and learning the lyrics. I thought I want that that sort of passion in this story. And because I think the great romances often become musicals, you know, they lend themselves to that energy and right. that sort of um, all stops out uh, jamboree feeling. So, um, so yeah, I, I felt it was natural for Carter to, to come out of that background. And I'm a Jewish guy from New Jersey. So I wanted to take advantage of that because one <laughs> of the things that I dreamed of for this book was what would happen if you took the Crown Prince of England to a Jewish wedding in Piscataway, New Jersey? <laughs> Your family. 
I thought we're always you more concerned with, oh, what if I met the Queen of England? What if I met Prince or Princess so-and-so? But I thought, well, what if they came over to our side? You know, what if they went to your temple or your church? You know, what if you took them to IHOP? All of which happens in, in playing the palace. So I yeah. love the idea of, also because it's a good test of someone, whether they're a royal or not. You know, when you invite them into your life and you sort of reveal yourself and you say, okay, here are my potentially really embarrassing favorite things to do. Here are my relatives who I both adore and am deeply embarrassed by. <laughs> you know, all of that. I thought what, I love that moment I've done it, you know, with, with my longtime partner of when you first make those introductions and you're pretty much blushing 24 seven. Um, and then what usually happens and it happens with Prince Edgar too is your your date or your eventual partner forms an alliance with your family against you. You know, suddenly they're in the corner talking about you and agreeing about what it, what needs to be changed about you and criticizing your hair and your wardrobe. So I love the idea of that happening, but with a prince at the middle of it. Um, so yeah, it was. I, I drew on a lot of the aspects of, of my own life and my history to uh, to sort of give Carter a, a sort of fully fleshed out background. So which one of your aunts is um, <laughs> the one tucking um, extra to goes in the purses and <laughs> dinner rolls into the purse, which that could be so many of my aunts, but my mom had two sisters who were both librarians. So there was books were quite an enormous part of, of my growing up and they were wonderful. And one thing we would do every year we would pretend or my aunts would claim and my mom would claim that we were taking a drive through New England to see the leaves change and to visit the whaling museums and to be you know historically appreciative and we were really hitting every outlet store you know from New Jersey to Waterville Maine and I just loved it it was such a great education for me in terms of shopping and humor and common decency you know these women were incredibly hardworking and so smart and so funny. And they also could not uh, resist a bargain. So they were, there were a lot of dinner rolls tucked into purses. There was all, I was brought up to believe that you do not go anywhere without bringing a white cardboard box with baked goods in it. You know that that was the rule that you, and whenever any of my aunts would go on a vacation to any foreign country, they would bring back gifts for everyone. And there would be a day where everything would be bestowed. So there was such a sense of um, generosity with a little bit of insanity around the edges. <laughs> um, and when, you know, whenever I would show up wearing, you know, a new shirt or my aunts would come to my apartment and I would have, you know, a new mug, there would be, where did you get it? What'd you pay? How much off? You know, there were, everything was examined with a sense of, you know, pleasure, but scrutiny. Um, so it was, yeah, Aunt Miriam in Playing the Palace is my tribute to all those ladies, especially as they get older, they sometimes start to shrink, but they don't get any less powerful. So you're dealing with what sometimes look like beautifully dressed garden gnomes who can kill you. So that that's, that's Aunt Miriam in a nutshell beautifully dressed garden gnomes that can kill you. I am going to have to remember that quote to describe, you know, my best friend's Jewish aunties. There you go, my play. They, you know, they're, they're the best people on earth and the scariest. Definitely some of the scariest. <laughs> and then we go over to England and we have Carter in England and completely out of his element in a lot of ways. And you've got kind of a little bit of the backstabby with Edgar's siblings and you've got this scary, you don't know if you're, she's rooting for you or you don't know if she wants to kill you, Queen of England. So, exactly. Oh, no, go on. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just saying, and how did the development of the royal family in your book kind of come about? And how much inspiration did you take from current or former royal family members? 
Well, there is somewhere else that I've been so impressed with, especially Queen Elizabeth, because think of how long she's been on the throne and she's behaved impeccably and she's been very respectful towards the rest of the world. You never get a sense of snobbery from her. You know, some people have found her a little chilly at times, and but she's progressed over the years. But I always thought, my God, there's someone who never, or at least not publicly indulges in self-pity, that she is, you know, kind of a great example for the rest of us in many ways. And she, I think she has also tried to use her position in the world to be an example and to be the spirit of her country. You know, other members of that family may be a little less so. And I think part of the allure of the royal family is their mystery. They don't do a lot of press. You know, you know that's why the, the Meghan and Harry interview with Oprah was such a revelation because they really usually don't talk to the rest of us um, so that we get to project on them. And that's what I was doing because I thought, okay, we know the public face of the royal family. And I could research, you know, what Buckingham Palace looks like inside and out but we don't know what really goes on behind those massive oak co closed doors. And even wonderful shows like The Crown are a matter of research and guesswork to a certain point because there really isn't a public record of what, how the family behaves in private. But I kept thinking, wait, there, aside from everything else, there's still a family, so, which means there's a pecking order, which means there are rivalries, which means there's devotion. And when it came to Queen Catherine, who I wanted to have to be, you know, an enormous obstacle for Carter, somebody who you did not mess with and someone who could literally have you killed. I mean, she's the, the monarch of a nation. And when he, and I, well, I thought first I thought, oh, you could have him being formally introduced, but I thought it would be much more fun if late one night while he's sort of trying to find a snack in the palace kitchens, suddenly the queen enters and he's crackers are spewing out of his mouth and he's in his sweats. And it's, you know, exactly the way you do not want to meet your potential mother-in-law. And with the- I have to tell you, the yeah. cracker scene made me laugh out loud so hard that I like, I think I spat water everywhere. Oh, I'm so, that's my dream. <laughs> <laughs> it was just the funniest thing I have read in a while because i was like oh god the queen of england is right there and this guy has crackers in his mouth <laughs> i'm like embarrassed and laughing hysterically at the same time for this character oh my god oh well that is how i will always picture you because that's my favorite response um, <laughs> well and i wanted to actually have some twists too because i thought at first you think oh my god does the queen just want carter out of there forever and is she you know just pure spite but I thought, no, 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 above all else, she's a woman who is deeply concerned about her grandson, about Prince Edgar, who's had, who's lost his parents and she's in charge of him. And I think when it comes to love, she takes that very seriously. So that I think she's not Carter's enemy, but she is someone who wants to make sure that her, her grandson is treated with complete respect and complete affection and by someone who's worthy of him. And that I understand. And suddenly you see that this is a woman with enormous heart. And, and also I love that there's a kind of balance between her and Aunt Miriam, that these are two formidable women who are, you know, putting, setting down the rules for the rest of their families. So I just, it, Creed Catherine was such a, was a joy to write because I could also unleash my inner tyrant to a certain extent. You know, someone who has no problem telling you how to behave and how to dress and how to conduct yourself for the rest of your life. I mean, I, I sort of admire people like that. And on the other hand, I sort of want to strangle them. So it's, um, it just was, was so much fun to, to create those kind of collisions. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, I love the foils between Aunt Miriam and Queen Catherine. And I think just how different matriarchs, but yet how similar they can be within a family are so fun. And then, of course, like, I don't want to get too far into spoilers in this, but I mean, it's a rom-com. It's happily ever after. And there's, you know, some conflicts along the way. Then we've got Edgar's younger brother and Edgar's younger sister-in-law. So how did the creation of them two come about where there was like this 
really interesting conflict between them. Oh, yeah, because when you watch any royal family where there are, you know, there who's next in line for the throne. So on some sense, okay, we all know that, you know, Charles is next unless he chooses not to be or unless Queen Elizabeth somehow manages to pass, you know, pass him by and choose someone younger. So I think there is, there must be some hidden or not so hidden competition there. And I think between Edgar and his brother, there's genuine love, but there's also a sense of, okay, who gets to be king and who gets to just be the brother? You know, who's the backup? Who's the understudy to the star? And so I think, and Edgar is such a, is a person who the world has tended to fall in love with. And his brother, maybe not so much, just a little bit, you know, more of a tight ass. And so it's sort of like when at the, I mean, this is, is you know, more somber, but when, Harry returned to London for, um, for Prince Philip's funeral. And the world's attention was on his relationship with William and whether the brothers were estranged or whether the brothers would use this occasion, you know, sad as it was to kind of make some amends for recent, recent quarrels. And so you were watching this family drama play out on every imaginable screen. And I thought that's you know, it's a whole other level of, of um, difficulty, but it also was fascinating because you thought, yeah, these are clearly guys who were very bonded and had been through so much with the death of their mother, but also there are grave differences between them. So yeah, that's the thing I wanted to take advantage of, that sense of, no, every family does not agree on everything. And I think when you're royals, you also, tend to want to keep your squabbles out of the spotlight. And, but what if that wasn't possible? Um, also, I think it's fun to watch the spouses start to work their way, you know, because when you watch, I mean, Kate Middleton, who seems so impressive, but there's a level of perfection there that can be a little terrifying. You know, the fact that she seems to have had like two or three children without gaining an ounce, you know, and that she always has the most perfect posture I've ever seen on a human being in my life. And then you watch Meghan Markle, who's a little more out there and has a, more of a warmth to her and a kind of giddiness. And you think, okay, those two women could be instant best friends. They could welcome each other, or maybe there's other stuff going on there. And you wonder, okay, how do people protect their spouses in a royal family? You know, what are the strategies? So it's, it's rich and it's rich comic turf because you think that's what we love to watch are you know, rich, famous, gorgeous people fighting. So it's, you know, the real housewives of Buckingham Palace. So, uh, <laughs> so I took full advantage. Yeah. And of course, like, you know, this manuscript was written well before, actually, how far before Megxit was this manuscript out? And like, oh, I got a good year or more that, uh, where yeah. I finished it. So, um, yeah. So I, mm -hmm. I love when things happen that make it seem sort of a little bit prescient about how what's going on right now yeah but it's you know it's fun because Megxit happened and then the Harry and o Harry and Meghan Oprah interview happened and now you're kind of looking at a book that seems like it just was meant to be with I mean obviously like I'm not trying to equate racism and LGBTQ issues but there's kind of a similar vibe to how like they're treated where Harry's having to protect Meghan and Edgar's trying to defend Carter and, you know, sort of a weird backwards turnaround of similar issues. You know, like, how has it been watching kind of all of the Harry and Meghan drama, knowing that you got this manuscript in your back pocket? Oh, well, I mean, some of that is just, you know, blind luck, but it's been fascinating to see where I, I watched them to see, okay, did I get it right? You know, and because Megan, everything you were just saying in terms of acceptance and I mean, in terms of introducing someone who is very non-traditional to a royal family, whether they are gay, whether they are biracial, you know, that sense of, okay, this is what the royal family needs if it's going to stay relevant in any way, but there's enormous resistance. Plus that you have always have that feeling of an entire nation and even the world getting a vote, you know, which seems appalling in terms of romance that you need to submit your choice to so many voices. Um, and that's both what, what 
Prince Edgar and and Harry have been going through. So and Megan is just seems so wonderfully winning and so capable and so smart about what she wants to do with her, you know, newfound authority. So I don't know how anyone could resist her, but clearly there are people who do. Um, so it's been fascinating because I, I when I watched the the Oprah interview where I thought they all handled themselves so beautifully. And the setting was so gorgeous too. It looked like a Maxfield Parish painting. I thought, oh my lord! Um, <laughs> and they, I, you know, and I kept fixating, of course, on ridiculous details like the fact that Harry's sock seemed a little short when he crossed his legs. Um, <laughs> but you know, you think, okay, that's the kind of stuff you have to think about when you're on global TV and being interviewed by Oprah. Um, so they were. Yeah, I also just thought one of the things I wanted to explore, which is clearly going on in, in, in reality, is the difference in social status between a commoner, an American, and a royal. And on one hand, that shouldn't matter at all. You know, we are way far along, hopefully, in, in civilization where that's not a difference that matters. On the other hand, that's not the world we're living in. Um, so it's it's fascinating to see, okay, how does that play out? You know, that um, do you walk a few steps behind? What are the rules? Who tells you the rules? You know, I just, it becomes so constricting that love starts to seem suffocated and impossible. Um, but Harry and Meghan, you think they're clearly working very hard and being very savvy about how they can make their lives function in the world, you know, and retain their sort of royal cachet while using it for all sorts of new purposes. And I think that's what Carter and Edgar would do. So I think, um, yeah, I just love to think of those two couples getting together. <laughs> you know, somehow you get the feeling that Harry and Meghan have LGBTQ friends. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Little- and, you know, like watching Megan and watching all of her, you know, things and interviews, she's so, she seems so put together and she seems so calm. And, but then reading Carter and reading his like kind of inner monologue as he, we're going about with this um, story, I'm just wonder, you know, you can't help but wonder, you know, is this how she feels on the inside? Is this how stressed out she is? Is this, you know, how she wants to, she worries about presenting herself to the world all the time because this is sort of the same world that she comes out of. Oh, absolutely. It's funny when she was on uh, during the Oprah interview and she talked about how she was sort of thrown into this world and she wasn't that well-versed in royal protocol. So she wasn't sure about curtsying. She wasn't sure about deference, even about titles. And I think Carter has a sense of that too. When he first meets Edgar so unexpectedly early in the book at the United Nations at an event that Carter's been working on. And he goes into this mode of blind panic where you think, okay, this person is a royal. I never imagined in my wildest dreams that I would be around someone like that. And I have no idea of how to behave. You know, and on the other hand, I've got the most enormous instant crush. But what does that mean? You know, how do you go about hitting on a royal? You know, that is so nuts. Um, how do you get, how do you tell a royal that you want to date them without seeming like a creepy, weird stalker type almost? Oh, exactly. And you sort of assume everybody's after them, you know, and when they're this unit, when they're also a fantasy crush, you know, if you sort of grown up watching them grow up and you have maybe a lot of pictures on your computer of, of that guy. And it's, so it's sort of, you know, what if a Disney prince suddenly stepped off the screen? What would you do? Would you be paralyzed? Would you think, I don't know how to do this, so I'm going to run. Um, but what I love about Carter is that he's, constantly messing up and then pulls himself back together. You know, he's surrounded by friends and family who are certainly cheerleading for him, but he also tries his best under the most insane circumstances where you think, oh, and he doesn't also, he doesn't want to abandon his sort of true self. You know, he doesn't want to, okay, I'm going to suddenly become someone more acceptable and more conventional. 
because also I think that's not what Edgar falls in love with, that you wanna see how do you maintain, and this clearly is what Megan's dealing with too, your personality and your sense of self when you're being asked to perform that self at the same time. And I think it's something on a, a maybe a slightly lesser level we've all experienced, you know, when you're being presented to someone's family, when you're being given an award, when you're speaking at a graduation, where you're under any sort of focus that way. But then try to imagine if that was 24 hours a day and the minute you stumbled, the minute your shirt came untucked, the minute you were allowed to be photographed eating something, it was going to become a meme that would haunt you for the rest of your life. You know, so I think that's what Carter is, is coping with. So it's, um, yeah, it's an interesting set of obstacles. But that, that's what I love about it. That's why I think Royal Romance has so endured because people wonder, okay, what if? You know, that it's even if you don't pay attention to the royal family, there is something in that Cinderella trope that people right. relate to, you know? Yeah. And you, the other thing that I want to talk about with that is you mentioned you'd had this story kind of percolating, <coughs> excuse me, in your head for 20 years. But I think part of Megan and Harry's story and part of the royal story now and part of the story that comes about with Carter and Edgar in your book is the internet and the rise of viral meme-based internet and Twitter and how fast news travels and these horrible tabloids that have arisen in a lot of ways and fake news, quote unquote. But how has that setting, you think, how did that help percolate the story, like settle down this story into what it is and make it sort of this better setting plot with the internet? Oh yeah, no, I think it became essential. Just the way I think in a way I was waiting for a level of gay acceptance and awareness so that the characters would be, could be believably that, that out. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think decades ago, if, you, if you, you, know, were a student of the Royal Family, there was always scrutiny. There were private detectives, there were photographers, there were people who'd write scurrilous tell-all books, but there wasn't that sense of round the clock um, observation. And so, and I think especially because anyone nowadays, especially people who are Carter's age, are used to sharing every aspect of their life, whether it's on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or, you know, just via texts and emails. It's just a fact of their life that privacy has been redefined. But when you're involved with someone who, whose privacy needs to be extremely guarded, and who is constantly in danger of being hacked and whose most private moments can be monetized. You know that there are certain photographs and certain recordings that could make an unscrupulous person an awful lot of money. That's a big difference. And I think it's something Carter adjusts to, but it's part of the bargain where Carter has to really think about, okay, if I'm going to be involved with this man, however much I love him, this comes with baggage, you know, sort of world-class baggage. And there's an interview that Carter and Edgar do together as well, which is somewhat like the Oprah interview, but that takes a very different turn. And you have to, Carter realizes he will have to accept that or figure out a method of dealing with it. That, okay, imagine if every image on your phone and your desktop and your laptop was suddenly available to everyone in the world and was constantly being forward and got, you know, on one hand, it's, I think there's a high from getting that many likes for your wedding, you know, or for your, your wedding gown, um, or in this case, your wedding suit. But it's, on the other hand, you're gonna be picked apart. You know, you're gonna be um, like in the world's biggest high school, you know, <laughs> that it's people, the gossip level is, off the charts. So and I yeah. think yeah, that's a, that's a struggle. That's what redefines celebrity. I think it's why in a way a different kind of celebrity class has arisen that we used to look to movie stars who become very, very private. And even though we can, you know, watch Bennifer come back together 
there's more a sense of the internet celebrity, you know, whether it's a Kardashian, whether it's a TikTok star, those are the people who the world tends to, to fetishize nowadays. You know, people who are willing to live online and people who have also sort of mastered that format. People who say, okay, I know how far I can go. I know what I should keep private, if privacy is even possible. But so, so Carter learns the hard way, like, no, you can't share everything anymore. That's not an option for you. In a way, he has to go back in time, you know, to before the pre-internet days where everything had to be thought through and you can't just, you know, yeah. click. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting to see, you know, the internet has been an enormous gift to the world. It's also created so many dangers, you know, and so many new, uh, it created new ways of falling in love and new ways of destroying everyone. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's tough. But yeah, I love, I think it did become, it really informs playing the palace, you know, it's part of their lives. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, as a millennial myself, you know, Carter, I see, you know, Carter has probably grown up with, you know, the lack of internet and gone into the internet era. And then like having to pull back is almost like, what am I doing this? I don't know how to handle this. Yep. Because I just like, I can't imagine having to suddenly stop taking pictures and putting them on Instagram and putting them on Facebook and stopping having to tweet. <laughs> like I couldn't do it. Oh yeah, no, Carter, at one point he says, it's like, you know, Sometimes when people lose an arm or a leg, they have phantom limb pain where you still imagine it's there. So that, and that his fingers twitch from wanting to do, to live the way he always lived and knowing he can't quite. Um, on the other hand, he probably has access to far better Photoshop, but it's, uh, you know, but yeah, I think it's, it's really hard. Cause I think when it's second nature as it is, I mean, I'm far from a millennial, but I know that um, from friends that it is, it's just taken for granted. And, but you think with Megan, you also see it makes your friends kind of close ranks around you, which I think happens mm -hmm. with Carter, that there are yeah. people who realize, okay, we now have to protect this person in a way we had never imagined we would. You know, that we are also going to be constantly questioned and constantly bribed, you know, to divulge very mm -hmm. personal details. And so I love that about Carter's friends and family, that they do not sell him out. It doesn't even occur to Absolutely them. Absolutely not. Like, no, no, no this is our guy. Yeah, Carter's support squad is one of my favorite parts of the book. His roommates are amazing. Oh, I'm so glad you think so. Yeah, because that I just loved throwing that. And also you think that's a whole other, you know, when you introduce the, the special person, whoever you're dating to your friends, that's really daunting because you know, okay, they've got scorecards. They're calling you, they're texting you, you know, during the introduction there so that it's fun to see because they are they also want the best for Carter. You know, you sort of think, okay, is this the right guy or are we going to have to like do an intervention? You know, and say, ah, no, 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 send it packing. Um, so it's fun. And especially because his friend Louise, who is has a very different political point of view towards royalty, who sees them very much as something outdated and potentially quite harmful. You know, she's far more on the social justice side. So it's fun to see her deal with Prince Edgar and vice versa, you know, because I think he's also gotten used to people saying the monarchy is this useless, potentially politically awful relic that we need to abolish. So it's fun to see them go head to head. But and Carter's sister, Abby, who I love because they bonded very early in life and they are also both wedding freaks. So um, Abby's uh, acceptance of Prince Edgar is a huge deal for Carter. I mean, I think if she said no, if she had questions, it could end the relationship. You know, she's the person you look to who you say, is this the right thing? Is this the right guy? Um, and I, so I love that kind of closeness. And you find out the details of why, they're, um, why their bond has deepened over the years. But she's probably his ultimate go-to. They have what they call um, Abby alerts on their phones that when either of them falls truly in love, they have to immediately contact each other for the most serious discussion, you know, and to figure out, yeah. okay, do we both agree on this? Um, so yeah, I think everybody needs that, that support system. 
Yeah, Abby was one of my absolute favorite characters in the entire book, too. Like, I I think everybody needs an Abby to double check them at every turn of their life when it comes to weddings. Oh, yeah. And I love Abby because she, I always admire people with that degree of confidence. I mean, Abby's a doctor and she's a bridezilla and she's all sorts of things that she's just the most devoted sister in the world. And she's pretty loud, you know, but that she just doesn't take anything from anybody. And I, you know, because I can be more anxious than that and a little more withdrawn. So I love watching people who have no problem telling everyone their opinion, you know, in real time. They don't say that. Um, and because Abby's so loving towards Carter, you get that, no, she's not jealous. She's not picking on him. She's just protecting him and at full volume. So at her wedding. So it was, um, she, I, I love their writing the two of them together. Yeah, she's so great. She is so great. And I also just, the roommates are great. The scene where he finally brings Prince Edgar up to introduce him to all of his roommates and Luis is just staring at him like angrily. <laughs> yeah, because she's also, she is so determined not to be impressed by his royalty. You know that it's, she's like, no, no, no. You don't get any bonus points. You don't get off you don't get away with anything just because you are a prince in my Hell's Kitchen apartment. If anything, you are even more on probation. So I love that. And I love that Edgar enjoys it. I think that's another test that he passes. And I also, I just love the idea of bringing um, a crown prince back to your tiny midtown bedroom where you're not sure how clean the sheets are. You're not sure if the Ikea bookshelf is gonna fall on, over on top of you. You know, you wonder, how are we gonna deal with the bathroom, which is shared by everyone. So that just seemed part of the, the, the fun of this whole story is, okay, put a prince right there, you know, with your broken coffee maker and your, um, you know, mismatched china and everything else. So it's, um, yeah, I like, because I, I think with both of them, there are many hurdles that they yeah. scale and they say, okay, we can, and the more success they find, the more and the more they're both checked out by their different, you know, tribes, the better they feel like, okay, we are, we're doing this, you know, and we, we, we've, we've gotten a passing grade. So I think yep. that was part of, which happens to everybody, whether you're, you know, involved with the Grand Prince or not. But, um, but yeah, I think with, with Carter's squad, they're tough cookies. Yeah, I would say that Carter squad is just as tough as the other side of Buckingham oh, yeah. on Buckingham Palace, if not worse. I mean, oh yeah, because they're, they're less polite. Oh yeah, much less polite. They're millennials from New York. They're not gonna hold back a thing. Oh, exactly, exactly, and they're not gonna hold back a thing in public. You know that, it, and that they're going to. What I love is I think they're also secretly really tickled that there's a royal in their apartment. You know, that it's like, okay, we're not gonna let Edgar see this, but oh my God, look who's right next to us. Look whose hand I'm shaking. Um, that that's part of the fun is like, how did they behave? You know, and how, strenu how, how strenuously do they try to make sure Edgar knows they're not impressed? You know, cause that's yeah. the New York, cause the New York attitude is basically, excuse me, we're all famous. You know, yeah. and so you don't get brownie points. Um, yeah. So that New Yorkers have a whole thing about you don't you don't confront the celebrities, you don't mess with the celebrities, you don't acknowledge that the celebrity is walking the dog at the park next to you. Exactly. You pretend that you didn't even notice. They are normal people, right there. Right. It's like I don't care that Tina Fey is across the street walking her dog. I'm yep. just going to keep going. Exactly. Exactly. And you're. There, yeah, that's so exactly right. That there's this sort of unspoken agreement that, you know, when I see you, Jackman, on my corner, and I think, okay, you know, there is a brief moment of brain freeze, which I think the celebrities are aware of, that everywhere they go, they're watching people decide to ignore them, you know, but they know they've just been clocked in a way, that sense of like, okay, those five people just recognized me and they're all making such an effort not to. So I think it's, it's fun. It's the New York 
um, method. Yeah, definitely. So what other, like, what has been your favorite part about writing this book, writing, delving into rom-com and just besides finally getting to write happily ever afters, what has been, what's been fun about playing the palace for you? Well, I think it was creating that world and saying, okay, especially I was editing the final galleys during the pandemic, during the lockdown. And I love being able to escape to that world and say, okay, no one's wearing a mask. Um, even, and believe me, I believe in wearing masks. Um, so that I loved just seeing what could happen. Also, it, when you put a gay couple at the center of, in many ways, a traditional romantic comedy, when I was thinking about movies like Notting Hill and My Best Friend's Wedding and Roman Holiday, which a much earlier Audrey Hepburn film. And I thought, okay, what if it's two guys? What is that change? What is that not change in the slightest? You know, I love being able to update a form that way. And you're not far from alone in that. There are, there are many actually royal gay, gay books out there, but it's, um, it's still, there's a freshness there that I think readers respond to that sense of, okay, we've heard these stories of royal romance many times, what's new about yours? So I enjoyed saying, okay, what would this change? There's a moment also when Edgar and uh, Carter go to a rugby match and when afterwards Edgar gets very honest with Carter about what he's been through earlier in his life and the way he's held to a different standard, not just as a royal, but as a representative of the gay community. You know, I think if you were the first out prince, you are being used as a potential role model, as a leader, as someone with influence. And you'd also be horribly criticized even by, you know, your own people. There'd be a sense that you were not gay enough or you weren't gay in the right way or that you were not being sufficiently attentive to the rest of your community. And all of which Edgar understands and takes very seriously. But I like trying to, you know, put myself in that position of that level of, um, of judgment, of that sense of, okay, God, I'm, I'm the gay figurehead. And I know because I've watched with friends of mine who are gay actors, and now, thank God, there are far more out gay actors so that when you cast a gay romantic comedy, of which there are more and more, you can actually take advantage of that acting pool. For many years, an argument that Hollywood would make was, oh, we would love to do a gay story, but there's the audience is so tiny, or we would love to cast gay actors, but give us someone who's gay with a name that sells tickets. And that was all sometimes code for, no, we're just not going to do this. And, you know, right. it happened with every racial minority as well. It happens, you know, it's happening to this day, that sense of the objections and the ones that are sometimes, you know, uh, clouded by a lot of fake sincerity. So, um, I mean, I've been, I'm old enough to have seen the gradual shift in that. And I, that's why I loved writing this book because I thought, no, this book would not have been possible even a very few years ago. And Berkeley, the publisher has been so wonderfully supportive with, with the, the campaign for the book, that sense of, okay, no, we trust that there's an audience for this material and that it's wildly diverse, that it is not just gay people, even though that's a great crowd, it's everybody. Um, and I found early on in my career when I started writing gay stories, for the theater and, and I wrote the movie In and Out that I thought, no, I am going to assume the best of people. I'm going to assume that the audience will be at the very least curious about gay lives and maybe potentially delighted. So, um, so I didn't worry it to death. And that was something else I enjoyed about writing this book. I thought, okay, this is a book I would have loved when I was a kid. This is, is a book that I really want to, to share with people to say, okay, Maybe, maybe you're up for this. Um, so yeah, that they just, there was, there was a real pleasure to writing it that, um, that I've had in, in other things I've worked on, but this was, I think sort of had a giddiness to it because it's a romantic comedy, that sense of, you know, Julia Roberts, Audrey Hepper, New Grant, fun. Um, and that, you know, I think it's something people feel when they read romance, that sense of, it's almost like your personal puppet show in the best way that where you maneuver these people you love and that have a real glamor to them into the positions you want them to be in. You know, you, you want them to fall in love. You want them to stumble. You want them to overcome. So, um, 
so that was a real joy in this because I mean I've written stories with with great gay romances at the center before, but never with this level of kind of dazzle and wealth. So that was fun. Yeah, that's awesome. Did you watch a lot of like other royal romance or read a lot of other royal romance kind of in preparation for this? Or did you just kind of, meh, I'm going to write my own story. I'm going to. Yeah, because when I, when I, I tell you, when I first started thinking about it ages ago, yeah, there weren't a lot of other books or movies like this. So that I was thinking, no, that's what was exciting about this was that there was a, a real newness to it. And I'm thrilled now to be part of a sort of climate of royal romance. Um, so yeah, no, I wanted it to be also because they were characters, especially Carter and his family that were very close to me. So I thought, no, that's, I want to integrate that with a level of a fantasy romance. Um, so yeah, I didn't borrow from anything other than kind of a tradition of romantic comedy, whether it is, is more current and Hallmark or, um, going back to the screwball comedies of the 30s with Cary Grant and Katherine Hepburn, you know, where yeah. you see two wonderfully attractive, sexy, interesting, smart people falling in love, making an enormous mess and then cleaning it all up. So that I loved participating in that, you know, saying, okay, that's the world I'm after. Um, yeah. And it's very tough because I remember, I remember I once saw an interview with Meg Ryan, you know, who had, was the real queen of romantic comedy for a good long spell where she said, and it sounds like something very simple to say, but it's very true. When they asked her about the difference in acting in romantic comedies, she said, it's not reality, it's something else. And she didn't define that, but she, it was so clear to me that, okay, no, you need to make an adjustment in your performance and the audience makes that adjustment in their appreciation where, okay, there's a level of fantasy and wish fulfillment here and we're all in it together. And that's part of, you know, why I think romance has, has so endured and is flourishing. You know, when you see someone on the subway and they're reading a romance, they're so happy and they're also so deeply lost in the book. You know, you could tell in a way they aren't maybe sometimes with, <laughs> with other forms of literature, they don't, there's not that swoon factor. And right. so I love it when you see someone who can't stop turning the pages, even though they also know, God willing, there will be a happy ending. But it's, um, again, it's a, it's a wonderful escape and a sort of heightened reality that I love that sense yeah. of, and again, it's something you share that shared with musical theater, that, that joy that you get mm -hmm. when you say, okay, we're gonna be a few feet off the ground here. Yeah. Do you think that having that background in screenwriting, having that background in playwriting, it helps with writing novels like that and getting that kind of disassociation? I guess disassociation isn't really the right word, but in a way it is, I mean. Yeah. No, why not? No, it's interesting. It's something I've learned from God knows trial and error. They're very different forms, but with certain things in common that, I mean, what I've learned is that there are, there are jokes and characters that will play wonderfully on stage that will thud the exact same moment in a, in a film version. But there's also a level of when you try to do a little kind of cross-pollination that especially that was part of what wanted to lend the, the joy of musical theater to other forms. So that it also, I mean, writing for the screen is kind of wonderful because you could do so much with dialogue. You also, if you wanna go from a Midtown apartment to Buckingham Palace, you can do it in an instant on screen. In a book, you need a little more travel time. In a play, it's almost impossible. So it's figuring out the differences, but also trying to see if you can translate the glamour of a big screen romance to a novel. You know, if you can borrow that joy and that kind of sparkle. And so that's it was useful that way, that sense of when you, also when I've worked on films and I've watched stars and realized what makes someone a star, what it's, because it isn't necessarily that they're more beautiful than everyone else. There is still some spark. There is something soulful about them that the world responds to. And that's what I tried to do with the characters in playing the palace, that there's a level sort of of stardom to them. You know, they're people who you invest in the way you want things to work out for, you know, Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling. Um, they're just, they, they become our dreams. And 
I love that. You know, I think that's nothing anyone should ever resist or be ashamed of. You know, and it doesn't mean they're better than the rest of us. It just means they have a, a sort of magic function for us. Um, yeah, and I think that's also what royals do because I thought they are another form of movie stars. You know, in that weird way that certain internet personalities, I think, take on a kind of greater dimension and also the gossip that surrounds them becomes every bit as juicy. You know, when there are wars between beauty influencers and you think, okay, so people know an awful lot about everyone nowadays. And they yeah. like the battles and they like the reconciliations. Um, and they sure wanna know what's happening with the Kardashians, no matter how much they trash them. <laughs> <laughs> everybody knows what's everyone knows how to keep up with them <laughs> oh my lord yes no it's funny when i watch the, when i watch them sometimes and i think should i be embarrassed about this but i think no there is something they figured themselves out on some level that i'm not sure is necessarily psychologically healthy for the world but it's still you have to give them a certain not necessarily respect but pay but certain props you have to say okay no Whatever this is, you're good at it, you know? Mm -hmm. And you think they've all become billionaires now. And so <laughs> that that's, it's a very strange type of accomplishment, but it's still an accomplishment. And it's something also that would only have been possible in the age of both reality television and the internet. You know, yeah. they, they were some of the first people to figure out how to lasso that, how to make that work for them. Um, and I have the feeling Megan and Harry are going to join them in that. You know, when you realize both the, the greater degree of openness, but also I think Megan and Harry are willing to live in the media more, yeah. which includes, you know, the, the internet. So um, it'll be interesting to see how they use that. In my head, I see Carter kind of becoming a royal, influ like a royal family influencer, where he's like this new bridge to being the open and out there royal family person. Oh, absolutely. No, I think he even sort of says it towards the end that he, the way he also wants to create a royal video game called Playing the Palace. But yeah, that I think he understands that world and he understands how people live online and realizes that can be useful for the royal family and that they shouldn't be afraid of it and that it's a real link. Because I think part of the, the appeal of the royal family is, that, is the distance, that sense of, okay, that's a world we can't quite enter. But on the other hand, I think people look for connections all the time. And I think Carter is that bridge, you know, that, and I think he would take enormous advantage of, 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 of social networks that he would say, no, 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 this is a way of reaching out. This is a way of making people understand how much you care about the rest of the world. And it's a form of access that you can use and you know not exploit it doesn't have to become ugly but that it can become um a way of caring and i think that's what the internet is at its best it's a way in which it, it turn makes us a, a global family and mm -hmm. i think the royals are tiny baby steps towards um you know utilizing all of those tools yeah. Well, I certainly am a huge fan of the internet because it allows me to do interviews like this. Yeah, exactly. And I would have never gotten a chance like this for before we started our YouTube channel and had you know, I don't know that you would have ever come to Dallas. <laughs> I, I, I had been to Dallas just a couple of times and loved it, especially the air conditioning. <laughs> the best air conditioning well, we on the planet. We need it after the hundred degrees of the summer. Oh yeah, no, so. I remember when someone walked me around and I realized you could get from one building to the next without ever going outside. I thought, oh, okay, these are smart people. Yes, very smart after not wanting to go outside. But anyways, um, our hour is just about up. Oh my God. I, it's like, I looked at the clock and went, oh, it's two o'clock already. <laughs> uh, wow, that went fast. Um, so what's on the, I'll just to wrap up, what's on the plate for you? What are projects you're allowed to talk about that you're working on? Well, there's a, a batch of things for movies and TV that I'm sort of too superstitious to go into. I'm co-writing the book for the, the Broadway musical of The Devil Wears Prada. <gasps> I forgot about that. 
I'm so excited. We try out in Chicago next summer. So it's in the future, but well underway. And I think it could be wonderful. And people certainly seem to be looking forward to it. Um, working on another book, working on, um, I just did something that was really fun in New, in New York that as a step towards live performance, I wrote a monologue that Nathan Lane, that sort of glorious Nathan Lane performed on stage at a Broadway theater with Savion Glover. And it was for an invited audience of healthcare workers and furloughed theater workers, you know, social distancing, masks, everything. But it was that first step. And so it was the first time I'd been back in a theater in over a year. And it was thrilling. Exactly. And That's to watch amazing. Nathan and Savion Glover. Oh my gosh. Just Nathan oh Lane. God. Yeah. So Nathan Lane is just one of my favorite people to watch on stage. When I saw him in um, the Addams Family musical a oh, while ago, amazing. what was that? When he was Gomez? Ugh, so good. No, no, I've known Nathan forever, and he is a joy on stage and off. And so to work with him again was a privilege, especially there was a feeling in that theater of such excitement and such generosity about, yes, Soon, 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 we will all be able to be here on a regular basis and they'll be able to be a full house. And that's what we are all yearning for. So that was that was a special treat. So yeah, so there's all sorts of stuff in the works. Awesome. And when can pe- where can people follow you to learn more about what you're doing, what you're... They can follow, I'm on Twitter at Paul Rudnick and why I am, I have a website, paulrudnick.com. I'm more and more on Instagram. I've only kind of just, just, gotten into that but there's a playing the palace um hashtag on instagram so they uh there are all sorts of outlets there yeah fun and for anybody who doesn't follow paul on twitter i highly recommend it it's hilarious on there oh thank you um the during the super bowl the one you tweeted about the um tom brady being the quarterback needs to have a dream sequence of why am i doing this that it kind of went viral and went everywhere. I was laughing so hard because I want it to happen. Oh, yeah. Listen, any sporting event could be improved by a dream ballet. Yes, absolutely. You know, that's how I experience the world. Any Anything could be improved by a dream ballet sequence. Let's just be real here. Lunch. Um, Lunch. Exactly. Absolutely. Yep. You know, going to work, having a dream ballet sequence in the middle. Oh, no, no, no. there's nothing that that couldn't use some choreography. Nothing at all. And the, see, I'm, I grew up on singing in the rain. So Sid Charisse was oh, my introduction. That's my favorite movie the of all time. If I had to that, Sid Charisse movie, was it. my introduction to this dream ballet sequence. Oh, so yeah. I had a good introduction to the dream ballet sequence. No, that is the kind of thing that will both is the greatest gift and will mark you for life, you know, because that movie is such, has such pure joy in it and it doesn't date in the slightest. And yeah, no, that's whenever, I mean, I'm very bad at making lists, but whenever people have asked about a favorite movie, that's usually where my brain um, instantly heads that you think, oh yeah, I can watch that forever. Absolutely. And then if you're following in Bang Books, make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. We have a newsletter, so sign up for that. Our website's in terabangbooks.com. There's going to be a link in the bio of this video to purchase Playing the Palace, which you should absolutely read because it is hilarious and it is so good. And I had just such a t- good time reading it and escaping into the world of Carter and Edgar and oh, thank just, you so much. Thank you for having me today. This has been just Thank you treat. so much. I'm such a huge fan of yours. And I've oh. been, you know, like when I got the email that I was doing this interview, I was just like, oh my gosh, Paul Rudnick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that is now mutual. Thank you. I, I, I have zero of the New York chill <laughs> <laughs> around <laughs> celebrities. <laughs> Which makes you a, a complete delight. So thank you for that. <laughs> So anyways, thank you guys so much for tuning into this video. Uh, We will see you at our next chat. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thanks again.